Please take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 17, if you would please. Matthew chapter 17. This is a message that I've been meditating on for some time, wondering how to bring forth its truth to us. You know, there are some experiences that a person goes through that they never forget. I'm thinking, of course, in light of uh, all the babies that have been born. Uh, I think uh, Brenda was telling me there's like 24, 25 babies that have been born to folks of our church family since October. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, but, you know, as you know, we have eight children, two girls and uh, six boys, six men, two ladies. Uh, my youngest is 25. My oldest is 40. Wow. Uh, that's something. But I was there for the birth of all eight of the children. And you know, there are just some things you never forget. And that's one of those uh, things. If you think I don't forget, I can imagine what Brenda must feel when her memory uh, strikes. But you know, there are some things that, we happen, that happen to us. We think of maybe meeting famous people. I was taught after I got saved and going to church that uh, it was a privilege to meet missionaries and uh, that we were encouraged as children to take our Bibles and go to the missionaries that would come through and uh, the, have the missionaries sign the Bible and put their favorite verse of Scripture, as many of them do. When guest preachers would come through, the same thing would take place. And I was taught to really look towards those type of heroes instead of the sports heroes and business heroes that many people of the world look to today. And uh, I can remember meeting some of the old saints of the past, uh, Lester Roloff and uh, John Rice and, and Bob Jones Sr. and Jr. and uh, some of those others that I could stand up here and name missionaries that have made a difference and an impact around the world and how uh, they just uh, stirred me and helped keep me focused as I would see how God would use uh, men and women to His honor and His glory. There are just some things you just don't forget. I remember also, it was closer to our 26th wedding anniversary, but in honor of our 25th, the church family sent Brenda and I on a cruise. And we went on the Alaskan cruise. And I'll be honest with you, I had mixed emotions about that. Um, you know, I'm thinking, who wants to be with five, 6,000 other people on this boat out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? And uh, then, you know, we went on that cruise and I said, now I can see why people want to be out in the middle of the ocean with about 6,000 other people. <laughs> and uh, we had a great time. Of course, the Veaches, who had been there for uh, a couple of times beforehand, they changed their holiday plans and they went with us on that cruise. And so we had the opportunity of going to Alaska with them. And, you know, they're just good memories. And as I'm recalling some of my memories, I'm sure that you would recall the same for yourself. There's just some things you don't forget. I can just imagine what the disciples, Peter, James, and John, must have had to go through their mind as they were really captured here in the Word of God, this account on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. I'd like to read the first nine verses of Scripture of Matthew chapter 17. The Bible here says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud <clears throat> overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. 
Can you imagine the experiences that the disciples had as they walked with the Lord Jesus Christ for some three and a half years? Think about that for a moment. We know that they trusted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. We know that also on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus walks up to Peter and James and John and he calls them and says, hey, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. And then from that time on, as he gathered the other disciples, stop and think about the miracles that they witnessed, the sights they beheld, the exciting words that came from the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, as the scribes and Pharisees would hear the teaching of Jesus, they, would, they said, this man speaks with authority. Can you imagine that the disciples heard the public discourses of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then as the crowd went away and the disciples gathered with their savior, he was able to share more intimate details about his teaching, about life, and they were witness to all of that. They experienced that. Not just in the formal gatherings that Jesus had, not just in the miracles, but even the casual going on of the Lord Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry, they were all a part of. I can just imagine as they're witnessing here, this on the Mount of Transfiguration. Think about that. They go up to this high mountain of all the people that Jesus could gather to himself. He asked Peter, James, and John to go with him. That must have been what a privilege, amen? I mean, what a privilege to be with the Lord Jesus at this, this particular time and be witness to the glory of Jesus Christ. And they saw Jesus transfigured before them. I make these observations. Here on this mount, they saw the glory of God in Jesus Christ. You can only wonder at the sight. The Bible here in this passage of scripture says that there was light there. And it was that bright light. And they saw the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, when you think about heaven, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, that there's not gonna be any need of the sun there. Uh, and you know, with the storms coming through this time of year, it's been pretty neat to see how that in the daytime as the sun breaks through the clouds, the sight that's beholden, the different colors at the sunset, and if you're up early enough in the morning to see the sun rise, and you see how it just glows in the sky, and it gives you your reds and your blues and your oranges, and how beautiful it is. But there in heaven, there's no need of any of that. And you think of all this that has been tainted because of sin that's entered the world and we look at it through our uh, tainted eyes and we say, how beautiful, how glorious can you imagine that there's no need of the sun in heaven because Jesus is there and he lights it up with his glory. We see that they saw the glory of God in Jesus Christ as well as they saw something so wonderful where Jesus Christ was transfigured before them. That word trans means to cross over. <laughs> it means a change of figure. It means to cross over and Jesus crossed over from the earthly to the heavenly and then back again from the heavenly to the earthly. What a sight that must have been. What a privilege to behold. And God saw fit to record this in his book, the Bible for you and me. Someone has written that in biology, a metamorphosis is a profound change in form from one stage to the next in the life history of an organism, as from the caterpillar to the pupa, and from the pupa to the adult butterfly. And we see how you see from one uh, seemingly insignificant, in some respects, ugly form to a beautiful butterfly. And we think we're beautiful this, in this day and time, some of us anyway. And uh, at the same time, there's going to be a transformation that takes place. Amen to that. And so we see here where Jesus is transfigured before them and they're witnessing this. The third thing I see here is we get a glimpse of what glory will be like for us. And I see that we will be like Jesus. And that's the glimpse that they saw in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Here's what the Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now understand, this is John the Beloved. 
This is the man who witnessed what we're preaching from today in Matthew chapter 17. This is the man that God was used to write and pen these words. And he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. God says, John, I want you to write this. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. You know, it's amazing to me that God would choose John to write this because Hey, John was there to saw Jesus, see Jesus transfigured before them. And so if there was a man that was qualified to write these words and pen these words, John is that one. And you see how the connection is made. We're going to be like Jesus as well in our glorified body. Wow. And I see this too. We will recognize each other in heaven. You know, it's hard to wrap our minds around this, isn't it? But here we find in verse 3 of our text, it says, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. They recognized who was in their presence. There was Moses. There was Elijah. And so it's so important for us to understand that we're going to recognize one another in heaven. I'm going to know you. You're going to know me. That's going to be a good thing. And you know what? We'll all get along. <laughs> We'll all like each other. <laughs> Amen. Won't that be wonderful? In eternity, people will recognize each other. We see a glimpse of that too in uh, the book of Luke, uh, chapter 15, when we have the rich man and Lazarus, and they both pass away. They both go, go into eternity. One goes to a place called hell, and one goes to, it says, Abraham's bosom, which is paradise. And of course, at the resurrection, we find that at the cruci crucifixion in that three days and three nights, Jesus Christ led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And they were taken from the place of paradise to be with the Savior. We re we'll recognize each other in heaven. And also, we'll be in the presence of Christ where no impurity is. Have you thought about that? No impurity, no defilement. No dirt, no sin. It's going to be a place of purity. It's going to be a place where Jesus is. In this passage of Scripture, as I mentioned just a moment ago, here you have Jesus taking Peter, James, and John up to this high mountain. I don't know if they knew what was going to take place. Apparently, they really didn't. And we see here that all of a sudden, there's Moses and Elijah. You see a blending of the Old Testament dispensation and period of time, and the Old Testament teaching, you see a blending coming together. You have Moses as a representative of the law, you have Elijah as a representative of the prophets, and you have Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the God of all grace. And how we find that they're all blended together, Jesus the Messiah, everything pointed to Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, you have these words, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. There was no salvation in the law. There's no salvation in keeping the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments in the law showed mankind their sinfulness and how that there was no way that we could keep the 613 or 613. 15 commands that were given in the Old Testament that people tried to adhere to. And we finally throw our hands up and say, it's impossible. It's impossible to attain perfection in this flesh. We must put our faith and our trust in something or someone else. And hence in the Old Testament scriptures, we have the sacrificial lamb picturing the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. His name is Jesus Christ. And we find that all being brought together. And the Bible goes on to say here that the prophets spoke of the coming Messiah, Elijah. He's the one that represents that. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. 
take your Bibles, if you would, go to Colossians chapter 1. And of course, we have here the book of Colossians talks about the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll read about that. In Colossians chapter 1, I want to drop down and begin reading here in verse 12. The Bible here says these words. It says, but I would have you understand, ye understand, brethren, that the things which happen, oh, excuse me, I'm in Philippians. Colossians, <laughs> that helps. In verse 12, it says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now he is in the flesh writing this to a church, a local church congregation, a church meeting in the city of Colossae. And you notice here, he says he's translated us. When you got saved, positionally speaking, you are already seated with him in the heavenlies. You already crossed over, so to speak. What an amazing, powerful truth that is. And it says here, it says, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And if your Bible doesn't say that, you need to get a real Bible. Get yourself a King James Bible. Most of the modern versions take that verse of scripture out or they mess with the wording. Folks, you can't be saved apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. It says these words in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. This also lets you know about what we refer to as the eternality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus always has been. He always will be. He didn't just come into existence at the birth there in uh, Bethlehem. He always has been. He created everything by the word of his mouth. John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It was made flesh, but the word always has been. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, the Bible says. He says in verse 17, he says, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to re reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. My friend, that's what it's all about. I mean, we want to live our lives in such a way where we stand before him unashamed and complete in him. He says, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Some people have said, you know, there's no, you should, there's no uh, basis for asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you. Well, it says, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So when you got saved, Christ came in. Amen. So where is he? He's in you. So it's okay. Christ is all you need. 
uh, number 28, verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's why we do what we do. Uh, we have church, we have Sunday school, we have special meetings and so on and so forth so that we can be presented fully mature and perfect to our blessed Savior. Don't look at the rebukes and the reproofs of Scripture as something that's bad. It's part of the maturing process so that we can stand unblameable before Him. Amen. So we see this, how important it is to understand what took place, even as a picture for us on this Mount of Transfiguration. I just stand in awe. i be honest with you, I never really had it impact me like it's impacted me in recent weeks. To, I've read the account, I've, I've not really heard much preaching about it, I've heard it referenced and so on, but as you look at it you say, wow, what an event that has taken place and Jesus in his earthly ministry continued time and time again to show mankind that he is the Savior, he is the only hope for this world. Let's draw quickly some powerful truths I believe to live by. Number one, it is good to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. It is good to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Peter recognized that. He says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Anywhere that Jesus is, it's good to be there. It's good to be there. Stop and think for a moment. We know in our minds, we may even know the reality of our walk with Him day by day, and because we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us that there's never a time where we're forsaken. He says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. But you know, you can be in the presence of someone, but really not enjoy their presence. You can be in the presence of someone, but really not really recognize their existence. And many Christians live that way. But you know, there's just something when you pray in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15, he talks about entering into thy closet. There's something about it when you and I pray that we are ushered in and focused right on one individual, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in Matthew chapter 17, it's amazing to me where after they saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus and the cloud comes down and God talks to them out of the cloud and says, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. Then we find that, hey, when they came to themselves and they looked around, they didn't see Moses. They didn't see Elijah. They saw Jesus only. And you know, when you and I go into our closet to pray, when, when I'm talking about a closet, that means a particular place. That means an isolated place for us where we can go and we know that we're going to be talking to the blessed Savior. That's a, that's a special place. That's where Jesus is. That's where God is. That's where we go to meet Him. We're in His presence. Oh, we see Jesus only. It's good for you. And it's good for me to be in prayer. And that's why the devil fights us so much in regards to our prayer life. That's why he doesn't want us to pray as a church family. That's why he doesn't want you to pray individually. That's why you find prayer time so hard. Let's be honest. It's one of the most difficult disciplines and opportunities and privileges we have as Christians to actually talk to our Heavenly Father. But it's a lot easier to think about things yourself and rationalize it out and maybe work it out in paper, or maybe go to our friends and say, what do you think? And hey, how about this? Or, or maybe we can go to the bookstore and we can go online and we could Google the answer and hopefully we hit upon the right one that might give us a right answer. But my friend, eh, we have the mind of Christ. Corinthians tells us that in chapter two, we have the mind of Christ. We have the word of God. We have his word on it. He says, this is what you need to do. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and he will guide us through his word. And as we always say, the Holy Spirit of God in us will never lead us contrary to the word of God in front of us. He'll guide us. His word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. How important it is for us to realize that 
It's good to be in the presence of Jesus. When you and I pray, we're in the presence of Jesus. Oh, we'd like to say, oh man, I wish I could be on that Mount of Transfiguration. Wouldn't that have been something to be right there with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus? Oh no, forget those guys. Let's just, let's just focus on Jesus. That would have been wonderful. We can go into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ anytime we want to, through the avenue of prayer. We have it better than the disciples. Because there were times where they were separated from the Savior. There were times where Jesus stayed in one place and they went into the town to buy food and so on. There were other things where Jesus said, you know, I'm going to stay up here in the mountain and pray. You guys go ahead and get in the ship and I'll meet you. And things like that. They were separated. We're never separated. We need to start thinking right. We need to start focusing right. We need to start praying more. And so it's good to be here. Peter said that. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Folks, when we pray, it's good for us to be there. It's good for us to be there. Also, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, he says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And this is the avenue that God has chosen to help his people have their faith built up through the preaching and teaching of the word of God. As I say so often, it's like he says there in the scriptures, he takes the foolish things of the world and the foolish means in the world to get across some powerful eternal truths. Here a preacher can get up and spit and sputter and stammer and I mean, to just uh, stomp his feet sometimes, clap his hands and raise his voice and proclaim loud and God makes eternal decisions in people's lives. My, the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. It's good for us to be here under the preaching of the Word of God. Never minimize the preaching of the Word of God. And I know I'm, I'm singing to the choir, preaching to the choir today. Because you're here and those of our church family listening by live stream. But my friend, we need to be careful in these days. Because it's so easy to slip into lethargy, spiritual lethargy, laziness. Where instead of this being the Lord's day, we just sort of plug God into Sunday. And then we've got our whole day planned out to go to the lake and fish and, and uh, go and hunt at times. And, and uh, go and uh, have barbecues. And you say, Pastor, are you against barbecuing and fishing and boats? And I'm tired of having to qualify remarks all the time. Folks, this is the Lord's day. Our emphasis ought to be on God and not just trying to fit God in. Hey, let's go to the early service so that we can go and have the rest of the day to ourselves. Oh my, we've come a long way in the wrong direction. And boy, I, I've even said to Brenda, I said, you know, it's going to be an adjustment for us even when we start having Sunday school again. I've been able to sleep in a, an hour later every Sunday morning. I've had one less lesson to prepare for every Sunday. We can get very comfortable. Very comfortable. And this is where our spiritual character has to kick in. And that's what I, my third point here is. It's good for us to be here in the presence of Jesus where God's people are. And I put in parentheses, the church. Amen. This is not the church of Mike Sullivan. This is not the church of the Baptist denomination. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Let's go there. <laughs> you know it, but it bears repeating in a message like this that God has ordained us to get together. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul writes to the pastor at the church in Ephesus, where we have the book of Ephesians. The pastor there is, Ty, uh, excuse me, is Timothy. And it says here in verse 15, Paul says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. We need to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Amen. You know, the thing about that is too, is well, that is one advantage parents have had with their children. 
is you've had the opportunity while you've been at home to actually teach your children to sit in church. You say, what do I mean? I, we're in the living room of our home. Yeah, but then you can actually teach them to sit in church as if they're sitting in church. You can teach them to be quiet. You can teach them to pay attention. I remember when we were at First Baptist there in Hammond, and uh, Dr. Howes did not allow children under the age of five in the auditorium. He would actually ask people out loud to usher their, you know, the, those, those out with kids and take them to the nursery because he didn't want anything to distract people who might be needing to listen to the Word of God. And so, you know, I, I, what we did as a family is when Laura was born, we had been sitting right up close, I think within five or six rows uh, from the front. Well, then when Laura was born, it put us right back to the back row. And any time there was a little peep that came from her, we just shot out that door because I didn't want to be the next illustration in the middle of a sermon because he would stop right there and say, please take the child out. I mean, he would just do that. I, I, I don't do, I don't operate that way. <laughs> but at the same time, he was just very serious about having people's attention for the preached word. But I can remember as she learned to sit in church and so on, we started moving closer and closer and closer to the front. Because you know, the closer you get to the front, the less distractions you see. And especially in an auditorium like this, you can see all kinds of, if you're sitting right there in the front row, you see what's happening over here. It's interesting sometimes. It's interesting the perspective I have all the time. But at the same time, <laughs> uh, then what happened is Michael was born. You know what? We had worked our way up to where we were right within five or six rows to the front with Laura. Then Michael was born. We went to the back row again. And we did the same thing when Mark was born. I mean, that's just the way it worked. But we're trying to teach our children to sit in church because the preached word is important. And this is where Jesus is. You know, we've been praying for the presence of Jesus when we meet in the prayer rooms, when the all night prayer chain is going on on Saturdays, when we're having our church service, we ask God to move in our services and take control of our services in our singing and in the preached word. Serious business. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst, he says. Do you realize he's right here? He's right here right now. It's good to be in church. Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Folks, when you pray, it's good for us to be here. <laughs> Amen? I mean, man, when you hear the preaching of the Word of God, it's good to hear the preaching of the Word of God. I love preaching. You ask my wife, if I'm not listening to the Bible many times, as I'm getting ready, I'm listening to some preaching. And I love getting some of those old time preachers and I was listening to a sermon by Lester Roloff this week on Dr. Law and Dr. Grace, one of his classics. You ought to listen to that sometimes instead of this modern junk sometimes it's out there. It's feel good, this feely, feely, goody, goody kind of stuff. We don't need any milk toast preaching. Jesus was not a milk toast preacher. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Oh my, serious business, the preaching of the world. It's good to be in the presence of Jesus. When you're with God's people, Jesus is there. Stop and think about that the next time you engage in conversations with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus is right there listening to every word. Number one, it's good to be in the presence of Jesus. Number two, don't miss the teaching moments that God sends our way. Say, so what do you mean by that? On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up there. They didn't know all that would take place. They were just in awe by what they saw. This was a moment that was special for them. You know, they could have missed it. They could have missed it. 
And if you and I are not careful, we'll miss what God's trying to do in our life. The circumstances he allows us to go through, the people's paths that we cross, the situations we have to deal with. We need to make sure that we're understanding Romans 8, 28, for we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You notice here in verse five of our text passage of scripture, the Bible says that God spoke out of that cloud to those three men and says, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. Listen to what he has to say. That's why I go back to preaching and teaching of the word of God. Hear ye him. It's not about the man behind the pulpit. It's about the word of God and the words from the word of God that flows from his lips that that God inspires and uses in our lives. Don't miss the teaching moments that God sends our way. Number three, there is no need to fear when in the presence of Jesus. There's no need to fear when in the presence of Jesus. You know, one thing that we've been noticing in the messages and the sermons and the passages of Scripture we've been looking at is anytime fear has gripped the people in the Bible, Jesus always allayed those fears. He's always said, don't fear. Don't be afraid. I'm not giving you the spirit of fear. See, whenever Jesus shows up, you need not be afraid. You and Jesus are a majority in any situation. And he calms our fears, the Bible says. What a powerful truth. I mean, you and I don't need to be afraid. You say, well, what if I get sick? He's right there with us. He understands. He's the great physician. If he wants us healed, we can be healed. If he doesn't, hey, we need to embrace it for the glory of God. That's why Paul said, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. He prays sincerely, take this thorn in the flesh from me. Take this thorn in the flesh from me. Take this thorn in the flesh from me. Realize as Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for thee. I'll help you. I'm right here, he says. And so Paul says, I'll embrace it. And I'll embrace it not begrudgingly. Oh, what I have to go through. No, he says, I'll glory in it. Thank you, Jesus. There's no need to fear when in the presence of Jesus. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And then you go up to verse 8 of that same chapter, and he says these words, for God is love. And so where God is, there's love, and where there's love, there's no fear. No fear. There's no need to fear when in the presence of Jesus. And lastly, let me just say this. You cannot stay on the mountain indefinitely. You can't stay on the mountain indefinitely. What do I mean by that? Look at, if you would, at verse 14. It says, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. In other words, it's one thing you spend time in the prayer closet. You spend time listening to the preaching of the word of God. You spend time with God's family, enjoying fellowship one with another. But you know, you gotta come off the mountain and you have to go where the people are because Jesus Christ has a mission for us to fulfill. And that mission is to spread the good news and we ought to be looking for opportunities. You say, well, pastor, we've not been able to do what we normally do. Well, what can we do? What opportunities can we take advantage of? What can we do to give out the gospel? We have to think more innovatively. We have to think more deliberately in regards to how we get the gospel out. But get the gospel out, we must. Because the Great Commission is still the Great Commission no matter what we're going through. And the church of Jesus Christ, the church of Acts, always flourished in times of governmental influence and oppression. Church has always flourished. Our forefathers 
went through unbelievable things as they stood for Christ. And you would think that would actually squelch the gospel. But I would venture to say, even in these days, the gospel has been going out more and more because of the pandemic. Because now we're utilizing the technology so people are hearing that never heard before and they're hearing on a more regular basis than they ever knew that they could have the opportunity to do so. But we must be careful. We must be vigilant. Those of us who are used to what God has given to us. And even though we want to get the word out through the technology, God is still ordained for us to meet in one place at one time. You can't stay on the mountain indefinitely. Folks, we have a job to do. And the church of Jesus Christ needs to get to doing it. Amen? Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. I say this, you can spend time, and you ought to spend time. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. You can spend time on the mountain, but you must eventually go where the people are, the people that need to hear. 